Hi guys, welcome to today's uh, video lecture. Uh, we are in the New South Wales Central Tablelands on what is quite a brisk uh, winter's morning in July. Um, and today's theme uh, is all about temperature dependent behavior. So, as you know, um, a lot of animals are ectotherms. Um, now, ectotherms are uh, organisms that rely on the ambient temperature uh, to maintain their body temperature. Now, regardless of whether you're an ectotherm or an endotherm, so supposedly warm-blooded animals, um, our bodies are run by chemical reactions. Um, and chemical reactions are temperature dependent. The efficiency or the, how quickly chemical reactions can occur increases with increasing ambient temperature. Now, why am I going on about chemical reactions? Well, the underlying uh, mechanism of behavior is all about muscle movement. Now, muscle movement is all generated by electrical impulses to the muscles, tricking them to contract. Um, so the underlying neurology of behavior is all about chemical reactions. Ions being sucked into uh, neurons, reaching a critical threshold, and electrical pulses uh, subsequently being generated and being fired out from those neurons that ultimately lead to muscles and that electricity leads to muscle contraction. And behavior uh, is all about um, the contraction of muscles. With temperature, particularly if you're an ectotherm, your ability to move um, and essentially uh, express activity or behavior is temperature dependent. Um, as the ambient air temperature increases, so the sun gets higher in the sky, heats up the air and the ground, ectotherms can perform their behaviors progressively more efficiently. If it's too cold, those chemical reactions, the neurons firing become a lot slower and the activity of ectotherms as a consequence becomes slower as well. So as the temperature increases, uh, ectotherms, their activity becomes progressively greater as a consequence. So there is a tipping point, however. So although chemical reactions will progressively on an exponential curve, increase in efficiency with increasing temperature to effectively no end. Um, in the case of behavior and animals, that temperature curve plateaus out at an optimum. And if it gets too hot, of course, animals start to experience heat stress and the other underlying mechanisms of muscle contraction start to suffer. So what we see in ectotherms uh, is this classic humpback shaped pattern in performance. So performance can be activity, speed of activity, the rate of activity, the rate of calling, um, the speed of movements, uh, dispersal and all those sorts of things. So as temperature increases, ectotherms increase their activity, their uh, temperature dependence, performance as a consequence and then they reach this sweet zone where it plateaus where it flattens out and depending on the type of organism you're looking at whether it's a lizard or whether it's an ant um, that optimal window will vary um, depending on the species in question well i'm out here studying um, ants in particular a species of ant um, which are commonly called meat ants or grain ants. They'll be uh, familiar to most of you. They form very large nests in the environment that are uh, covered with tiny little pebbles um, and lots of little nest holes. Now these nests are very common, so the species is very common. We even get them in urban areas around Sydney, for example. Uh, but out here, there are a string of nests um, all the way around this valley. For a number of years, I've been coming out here and mapping 
the location of all these nests and the size of these nests. And you can work out the size of these nests by counting the number of entrance holes, um, which directly correlates to the, um, the depth of the nest and the overall size of the mound or the excavation of that nest as well. So one of the things that's characteristic of this particular species of ant is not only the general morphology of these nests being large, lots of uh, nest entrances, tiny little pebbles on the top, um, but these nests are often associated with um, eucalypt trees. And in particular, they form foraging trails to those eucalypt trees. So it's too cold yet for this nest to be particularly active. In fact, I wouldn't be able to get this close to this nest if they were active. Um, but they will form these foraging trails going up to these eucalypt trees. And if you follow the trail all the way up, they'll go up to the top of the canopy of that tree and you'll find little tiny clusters of aphids. Now these aphids secrete a sugary substance that these ants will harvest and bring back to the nest. We can scrape the surface of this nest and if it was warm enough for this nest to be active, all the ants would swarm out. Now scraping the nest is simulating a potential predation attack, for example, from an echidna. Now up in the tree, a disturbance from a bird would again induce this swarming behavior from these ants along the branches. So much so that anything that's actually sitting on those branches or trying to attack the aphids uh, is gonna have a lot of trouble uh, doing so. Some years there's uh, a new nest that's um, popping up somewhere and other years uh, there are nests actually dying, so no longer be used by these meat ants for whatever reason. And so I'm interested in understanding this dynamic from year to year. Uh, why are new nests formed and why are some nests better able to survive and thrive compared to other nests? And it seems to be linked to the microhabitat that the new nests are actually established. And it depends on ambient temperature. And the reason why I believe that is because of this temperature dependence performance curve that we have in ectotherms. So there is a trade-off. You can position your nest out in the open, which would be great during winter. You can maximize the amount of sun that's hitting the surface of that, temperature, uh, that nest to increase the temperature and let your workers go out and forage for longer and more efficiently during the day. But the flip side of that same coin is during the summer, it can get extremely hot out in the open. Um, so if you're exposed to direct sun without any shade, the surface of these uh, nests can reach as high as 80 degrees Celsius. Now to put that in perspective, if you were to put your hand against a rock or a, a slab of concrete, um, that was 80 degrees Celsius, you kept your hand there for a few seconds, you would actually get burnt. Uh, you would get uh, second to third degree burns on your hand as a consequence of that. So it's extremely hot. The ants do not come out of the nest in that sort of environment. Um, and for a longer period, that optimal temperature where it is suitable for these ants to come out of the nest will subsequently vary. To uh, measure their temperature dependent behavior, what I do is I set up a video camera over the nest um, and from dawn to dusk, every hour, um, I record the surface activity of the ants on this nest. But in particular, I also uh, simulate a predation attack. So these ants are predated upon by things like echidnas, particularly in this uh, field site. So here are a couple of excellent examples of what happens um, through predation on these nests. So these holes, these impressions left uh, on the surface of the nest is actually the consequence of an echidna coming along and attempting to burrow into the nest to feed on the ants and the eggs with inside the nest. If you scrape the nest with a stick, you're effectively simulating what the ants think is a potential predation attack. And so the ants will come bubbling out of their holes and swarm as they're trying to protect the nest. And how fast the ants are moving in that swarm is recorded by the video camera. 
and I take that video, return to the lab, and I can analyze the speed of the behavior uh, using motion analysis. And because I'm taking these at every hour, obviously the temperature will progressively increase during the day and then increase uh, late afternoon and towards dusk. So dawn to dusk, every hour, I can get an estimate of this maximum speed of their behavior, their swarm activity, um, and I can estimate their performance curves. And I've been doing this for a number of the different nests um, in this large network of nests in this valley. And so what I can do is, is I can determine not only the performance curve for these species of ants, but also the performance curves for individual nests. Some of these nests that I'm analysing are further back into the forest, some are further out in the open. And I've been doing this during the summer, where it typically ranges from dawn at about um, 10 degrees Celsius to a maximum of 80 degrees Celsius for some nests um, late afternoon. I've been doing it here in winter where it's um, minus uh, three or four at, dark, at dawn, so it's extremely cold. The surface of the nest is actually in frost and it heats up to about 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And so I can estimate these performance curves in the summer and in the winter by combining them, I can mathematically model uh, what sorts of microclimates are particularly suitable for these uh, nests and also uh, determine uh, the likelihood of nests flourishing in different locations throughout this valley. So the other system that I've been studying quite intensively um, are the social territorial displays of lizards. Now lizards are also ectotherms and their behaviour is also tied to the ambient temperature. Now I've been studying tropical lizards uh, in places like the Caribbean, the Anolis lizards, or in Southeast Asia, the Draco lizards. All of these do push-up uh, displays where males are advertising territorial ownership. We cover this quite extensively throughout the course. Um, but the ability for these lizards to be able to advertise territorial ownership using these displays is tied to the temperature. They can only do so many displays in the cooler um, morning hours compared to midday and late afternoon. So the display rate of these lizards is actually heavily tied to the ambient temperature. So their efficiency in defending and advertising their territories will change on a moment to moment basis purely because of the ambient temperature. And these are tropical lizards. So we're out here in Australia, um, in the uh, central tablelands where we have agamid lizards, so things like uh, jackie dragons and bearded dragons. These guys are heavily tied to the temperature as well, and more so because the temperature ranges are that more extreme. It gets a lot colder here, and it gets a lot hotter as well, compared to the tropics. There's a lot of behavior in the animal world in uh, the foraging efficiency and the social behavior and communication networks of fish, invertebrates, and reptiles. They're all tied to the ambient temperature and all change depend on the microhabitat and also daily uh, fluctuations and temperature as well. All of these are critical for the general maintenance of an individual being able to go out and forage effectively, also to avoid predation. If you're cold, you're unable to move as quickly, so you're more likely to be predated upon um, if you were experiencing a surprise attack, for example but also communication networks are temperature dependent. So how effective animals can communicate to one another uh, is heavily tied to the ambient temperature in ectotherms. And it's also tied to temperature to some extent in endotherms as well. Now endotherms, supposed warm-blooded animals, still uh, uh, have the mechanism of chemical reactions and neurons firing that are all temperature dependent. Um, but they have a core body temperature that buffers them more efficiently against the fluctuations um, in the environment in terms of temperature.